welcome everybody to our second uh, Volcanic Plumes webinar. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, uh, uh, I would like to uh, briefly talk about uh, what these webinars are really all about, uh, which I, you know, we mentioned briefly on Tuesday, but didn't spend a lot of time talking about. Um, so there are a bunch of acronyms out there. There is the SC4D, Subduction Zone 4D Initiative, the MCS, the Modeling uh, Collaboratory uh, for Subduction, uh, which these webinars are part of, and RCN, which are Research Collaboration Networks. So these first three bullet points provide a definition of what these are. So the SC4D is a vision of coordinated research to understand the processes that underlie subduction zone hazards. Um, it is a new initiative uh, by the US research community to study subduction zones through both space and time uh, with a focus on fundamental processes underlying geologic hazards uh, such as earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, and volcanic eruptions. Um, the SC4D focuses on designing targeted experiments to make the next big leaps uh, in studying subduction zones. Um, and there was a couple of years ago a, a sort of meeting um, out of which a vision document was produced. And you can go to this sc4d.org website where you can find the vision document and other information. But within this vision document coming out of this meeting um, were three components uh, were, were defined, identified. Uh, one is this, you know, the scope of an interdisciplinary science program. Uh, the idea of a modeling collaboratory for subduction zone science, and then a community infrastructure program. Um, so uh, in order to facilitate progress on these, um, uh, the National Science Foundation uh, funded several research coordination networks, uh, acronym RCM, and the uh, subduction zone, uh, sorry, the MCS, the Modeling Collaboratory uh, for Subduction, which these webinars are part of, is one of these uh, uh, research coordination networks. So it's funding by NSF to conduct workshops, webinars, uh, in order to define, outline um, how a modeling collaboratory could uh, uh, further subduction zone science and what such a modeling collaboratory should look like. And part of the half hour discussion session after uh, Costanza's and Larry's talks today, uh, the purpose is to engage the community uh, um, in a discussion about, okay, what, how, would a modeling collaboratory serve the community the best and, and what should it entail? Okay, um, <clears throat> apologize, apologies for the long introduction, but uh, and we've had enough questions to where uh, we felt this, uh, you know, we should elaborate on this. And again, if you go onto the uh, MCS or SC4D websites, uh, there will be, there's more information you can follow up on this. Um, I should mention also that we are planning uh, after these webinars to send out, uh, do a survey to see uh, amongst the participants of these webinars to see how we can improve these. Um, uh, given uh, the COVID situation, um, uh, it's not clear when or whether we'll be able to hold an in-person volcanic systems workshop. Um, and so we may want to do more webinars. I should mention that there are, have been in person, uh, have been two workshops. One is about uh, fluids and subduction zones. The other one was about mega thrust earthquakes. And the third one as part of this modeling collaboratory RCN was supposed to be a volcanic systems workshop, which 
is at this point postponed perhaps indefinitely and may become uh, replaced by more webinars and hopefully uh, online discussions to achieve the objective of these of this RCN, this research collaboration network. Okay, um, so let me introduce Costanza Bonadonna. Uh, she will be talking about eruption source parameters for modeling of volcanic ash transport and deposition. Costanza is professor of geological risk at the University of Geneva and she specializes in plume dispersal and tephra sedimentation and deposits. Thank you very much, uh, Helger, for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me okay? Cool. Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. And thanks again um, to the organizer for this invitation and to Antonio and Joe for the first two webinars of this series. So this webinar uh, is focused on the um, determination of eruption source parameters and summarizes the outcomes of the first two uh, workshops we organized in Geneva on the ash dispersal forecasting in civil aviation and uh, the more recent outcome of two European projects, Future Work and, and NeuroVolk. So well, first of all, what are the, the main, uh, so the key eruptive source parameters that we need for characterization of explosive eruptions and long-term tephra hazard assessments? So certainly erupted mass and plume height from which we can derive mass eruption rate uh, and duration and then information on grain size and uh, aggregation when it's available. And all this can be um, determined based on a combination of field work and empirical analytical modeling. For real-time much dispersal forecasting, we need more or less the same uh, eruptive source parameters, but given that we need them in real time, the determination is, is very different and is mostly based on geophysical monitoring. So in this um, webinar, we'll mostly talk about the differences in the determination of the eruptive source parameters in real-time and no real-time, depending on the need. So we start with the no real-time, so characterization of TEFA deposits. And I selected the one Putina Pinar eruption in Peru as a case study that is associated with the well-constrained isopark map from which uh, we could produce uh, a similar plot of thickness versus square root of isopark area. And given the many observations, we have four exponential segments and uh, the three fitting trends, power low, wavelength, and exponential seem to agree pretty well. The power low exponent is less than two meaning that the volume is sensitive to the distal integration limit. So if you look at the outcome, actually, even though there is a good agreement between the different um, uh, trends, there is still a difference in the final volume. This is just to kind of show that even when, the, when you have a good exposure, the choice of the, um, um, of the strategy for the calculation of the volume is important. In terms of plume height, as you know, we can use information on the distribution of the largest lithics and scorias or pumices around the volcano to derive um, the downwind range and crosswind range um, to calculate plume height and uh, wind velocity using the famous Gary Sparks 86 model. In this case, we get an average height of 33 kilometers, or we can actually use the more recent Rossi et al model where we have implemented the effect of wind on plume rise and gravitational spreading um, also in the distance um, less than the plume corner. In this case you see that we lose the um, univocal relation in between the crosswind distance and the plume height for a given downwind distance due to the wind and uh, we also normally have a lower plume height with respect to the carrier sparks model. Erupted mass and plume height can also be derived uh, using inversion of um, using analytical model like TEFRA2 and we can invert uh, mass per unit area uh, to constrain erupted, erupted mass uh, and column height but in this case you can see that we have a high uncertainty on the column height or we can invert a mass per unit area of each grain size to better constrain uh, both the mass and the column height. Then uh, in terms of grain size, you know that the, the grain size 
uh, typically decreases with distance from the vent, as it is the case for this case study of the climactic phase of Chaitén eruption in Chile, where we have a grain size with a median of about minus two um, feet, which is about eight millimeters, about five kilometers from the vent. And then, of course, you have a decrease in the mode um, as you go more distant. For example, like if you go to 150, 200 or 300 kilometers from the vent, you get mode of uh, more um, 500, 263 microns. So we need to put, so clearly, individual outcrops are not representative of the total density distribution um, or the material which is injected into the atmosphere. So we need to put all this uh, information together to come out with the total density distribution. Given that the distribution normally is not uniform, so we use the Boronoi tessellation to get something like this, which is the, let's say, the, the total grain size distribution. But as it is the case for the Chaitan, sometimes we have some sampling gaps. In this case, we have it at 100, 300, 700 kilometers. So in this case, we decided to use synthetic data to actually address these gaps. And we obtain another grain size distribution, which is only slightly different from the first one. And this is because in this particular case, even though we have significant gaps, but given the large exposure, we, 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 were, we actually managed to capture um, the general size decay uh, with distance from the vent, and in particular, the older transitions or the fallout regimes. But in other cases, like it is the, the case of a much smaller event, uh, Etna, the 29th of August 2011, we have this big gap between 0 0.7 and 15 kilometers. So in this case, actually using synthetic data is very important because we, if we don't use the, the synthetic data, we can get a bimodal distribution, which is the white histogram. But if we use synthetic data, we actually have a um, unimodal Gaussian distribution. So this is to say, uh, of course, we could talk a lot about um, eruptive source parameters from DEFRA deposits, but here I just wanted to highlight a few criticalities that need to be considered when we calculate um, Erupted volume or mass, plum height, and total grain size distribution. But then, of course, when we go in real time, the story is completely different. Uh, and we need to, we cannot rely on deposits because it takes too long uh, to get the um, erupted source parameters. So we need to rely on the physical monitoring and on a variety of sensors. So here, for example, you can see satellite X band weather radar, this drometer for the fallout, infrasonic array, airband radar, LIDAR, visible thermal camera, or in situ airborne sampling. These are just some of the sensors that can be used. So now we're just gonna see how we can use these uh, sensors and how they can help us constrain uh, key adaptive source parameters. So we start with the plume height because it's the easiest uh, parameter to constrain in real time. We can use a variety of sensors like radar, satellite, LIDAR, accelerometers, and, and so on. But even though um, it is considered the easiest parameter to constrain, there are still some issues. So first of all, uh, each technique is associated with uncertainty and plume height may rapidly vary with time as it is the case here for the Aetna 10 of April 2011 event. Here we can see the variation of plume height uh, with time as detected with the visible camera, which is the red curve, uh, the, the, weather, the X band weather radar, which is the black curve, MODIS, which is the green cross, and SEVERE, which is the uh, light blue um, curve. So as you can see, um, there are some, some, there is uncertainty associated with this um, detection, and there are differences also in the different uh, detection. So a range of heights should be provided rather than a single absolute value, even though this might be tricky um, in operational and Larry will talk about this later. Then the part of the plume or cloud for which the height is derived needs to be spe specified because it can be very different if you take the height of the overshooting, the top of the umbrella cloud or the neutral buoyancy level. So it's very important to really um, indicate which height we are actually uh, considering. And then, especially for the weak plumes, so the plumes which are bent over by the wind, we need to indicate the distance from the vent at which the height is detected because it can be, the height can be very different. Finally, a better standardization among different communities are required. For example, height should always be reported above sea level and consistently relative to the same datum. So this is just to show that even for uh, the plume height, which as I said is the easiest uh, parameter to constrain, there are still some issues that need to be considered. 
But now we come to the total gain side distribution, which is my favorite and is the more challenging and, and complex, let's say, to derive. Um, also, well, especially in real time, because the comprehensive real time technique uh, does not exist um, that can provide the rapid mass associated with the whole particle spectrum. So we need to consider a variety of sensors. For example, the LiDAR um, gives information uh, for the fine ash. Uh, X-band weather radar, we can say like uh, Corsage and Lapilli, L-band, uh, Lapilli, in-situ sampling, and satellite radiometer, very fine ash, and this drometer, let's say, uh, Corsage. Right now, there is kind of work in progress on trying to use a drometer to provide uh, distribution in real time, but mostly um, operation is the satellite uh, retrievers which are used. But in general, we can say that the, to have the full spectrum of, of sizes, the, the, the total gain distribution need to be derived using a combination of techniques. And here, I'm just gonna show you two case studies um, to discuss the meaning of the total gain distribution, but especially the meaning of the satellite retrieval. So here we have the first case study, which is the AFRT Kutor eruption in 2010 in Iceland. As you know, this was an eruption that went on for more than a month. Here we're just talking about the period between 4 and 8 of May. So here we have um, uh, ground mass per unit area and uh, grain size uh, information. So we calculate the, the erupted mass with exponential power low and weighbull. And of course, we consider um, sizes in between 8 millimeter and 0 0.2 micro. We want to combine this information with the satellite retrieval. And here, of course, we consider the, um, only the 7 to 9 feet because this is the only size that can be retrieved. And we can obtain two different distributions. What I call the whole deposit grain size distribution, which is the TGSD of the ground, let's say, and the total grain size distribution, which is ground plus uh, satellite retrieval. And as you can see, you can see this blob around seven to eight, nine uh, feet. In general, depending on the integration uh, strategy we use to calculate the, the erupted mass, we can say the two to 10 percent of the total erupted mass is in the cloud up to 1,000 kilometers. But more interestingly, 46% uh, of the 7 to 9 feet particles must have fallen on the ground as aggregates or fingers, because, because otherwise if you had fallen uh, individually, you wouldn't have fallen on the ground. But as you can see here, actually there's quite a lot of uh, 7 to 9 feet particles on the ground. And um, we have applied uh, a similar strategies to the 29 of August 2011 uh, uh, case study that I mentioned earlier. As I said, for, for, for this case study, we have a whole deposit grain size distribution, and we wanted to add um, also the satellite uh, contribution. So we have the plume cloud grain size distribution, in this case, between six to 10 feet. And we have this total grain size distribution, which is the black histogram. So we can say that the, the, the ground distribution mostly contributes to the coarse population and the satellite to the fine population. The first interesting uh, observation is that if we fit the empirical uh, whole deposit grain size distribution, so not the total grain size distribution, but the, the, the distribution of the deposit distribution, uh, if we fit the Rosin Rambler, then um, we get a distribution which is very similar to the Rossi Rambler or the total grain size distribution, which can predict a, a similar fraction of 6 to 10 phi. And interestingly, also you can see there is about 10% of mass predicted by the Rossi Rambler of the um, whole deposit grain size distribution and the total grain size distribution that probably is not predicted by the satellite. So the satellite obviously can only see six to ten feet because this is basically because of the wavelength but there is a whole um, material a, a three four five uh, feet which probably is in the cloud and is not seen by the satellite in this case only three percent of the total six to ten feet particles found on the ground as aggregates or fingers um, which is very different from the 46 percent of the Kuto, and this is clearly due to the different eruptive styles and the different grain size distribution. But I want to spend um, a few words on the application of the Rossi Rambler. 
because we applied the Rosen Ramler on 50 field tefra deposit and 20 synthetic uh, tefra deposit, and we found that the Rosen Ramler shows the best compromise between fitting capacity and stability with respect to the sampling bias. And we used the Ropeo 96 eruption as a, as a um, case study to investigate um, basically the stability of the Rosen Ramler. And we can see that. Um, we can reconstruct the whole deposit crystal distribution only based on X0, which is uh, the Rossi Ramler parameter related to the media current size. So, for example, you can see in this plot, if I constrain X0 uh, from the media current size of the empirical um, distribution, then I can well reproduce my uh, whole deposit crystal distribution, which is the black dots, by ranging L, which is the other Rossi Ramler parameter, within a certain range. Um, provided by literature, literature data. And interestingly, the Rossi Rambler um, can, is, the, is the strategy that can best reproduce the tails. Okay, so it reproduces the tails, but it cannot reproduce the bimodality. But in this particular case, we are particularly interested in the tail of the distribution, which is the fine material which normally is lost at sea. And in particular, we started investigating the Rossi Rambler, especially for the um, uh, use of the distrometers, which of course, as I said before, can only provide information on, um, on the corsage. So it's important to also understand, you know, if you only have information on the coarse part of the material, we want information on the tails and the Rossi Rambler is basically the best strategy we found. So it's still a work in progress, the same. Anyway, so going back to the general uh, idea of, of, of uh, deriving green side distribution in real time, we can say that, um, well, green side distribution is still work in progress. We still cannot do it. And density in shape, for sure, we cannot detect in real time. So uh, we can say that uh, total green side distribution and particle properties should be derived from field studies. And we should, uh, we should construct a real density function that at least we can use in the first simulation um, of real-time forecast. And then eventually uh, data simulation can be used um, based on satellite retrievals. But at least for the first simulation, it would be nice to have pro density function from field studies, both on greater distribution and particle properties like density and shape. Okay, finally, uh, mass eruption rate. Uh, as I said before, there is no, um, Basically, we don't have a technique that can provide erupted mass associated with the whole spectrum of particle sizes. This is, of course, a problem for the grand size distribution, but it's also a problem with the mass eruption rate. So also the mass eruption rate can only be derived from a combination of various techniques. Or, as it is normally done now, the mass eruption rate is calculated from the room height using um, a variety of, uh, of equations uh, or strategies. But in this case, it's very important to consider um, the strategy used depending on, on the dynamic of the plume, whether we have a strong plume or a weak plume, because we have seen that um, if we have a strong wind, basically, if we don't use a strategy that considers the um, effect of wind advection, we can actually um, underestimate uh, the, the mass eruption rate by several order of magnitude. In terms of combining um, different strategies. Here is an example again at ETA for the 23 November 2013 event. Here uh, you can see combined, well, compared um, basically the application of two, uh, well, of, of the empirical, one empirical relation, uh, the purple, and one analyti analytical relation using the plume height from the X band with the radar. You can see there is a difference because of course of the difference of these two equations. Then we can see the um, mass eruption rate calculated from the X band uh, directly, which is the dark blue, and from the L band, which is the light blue, and from the thermal camera, which is the green. So you can see there's a general agreement, but there are some significant differences at the beginning and at the end of the event, which of course need to be investigated. The application to, a, to another event, Aetna, uh, also shows some variability. Here we have the L-band in blue, 
the infrasound in red, the um, thermal in orange, and the X-band weather radar in green. In this case, we had ice in the in the clouds, so the severity, of course, couldn't really uh, well detect the ash. So, of course, there is a problem there, and we can see there is a, a discrepancy with the average mass eruption rate derived from from the deposit. So, again, there are some differences and uncertainties that still need to be investigated on the um, determination of mass eruption rate using um, various, uh, various sensors. Okay, so to conclude, some take home messages and, and open questions. So um, clearly, an accurate characterization of eruption source term is crucial um, to tephra dispersal and sedimentation modeling, both for long-term hazard assessment and real-time forecasting. Here, I mostly talk about mass eruption rate, plume height, so the grid distribution, but of course there are others, like for example, the vertical mass and grid distribution, for which we don't really get a lot of information, for example, from the field uh, characterization. So other strategies should be used. But in general, we can say that we need a synergistic approach combining modeling, field, and value of physical techniques. But more work still needs to be done to better understand the, out the outcome of each strategy. And then um, we need both real-time and no real-time characterization. Uh, of course, the real time we needed for real time forecasting data simulation, the no real time for model validation for the construction hazard scenario in PDF, and uh, also for long term hazard assessment. But of course, uh, we need to deal with uncertainties. And we have both epistemic uncertainties that can be addressed in proving the parameterization, or aleatoric uncertainties can be addressed by identifying appropriate activity scenarios and probability density functions. Well, of course, uh, uncertainty is especially difficult to treat um, operationally. Larry probably will talk about that. So we still need to identify um, an efficient strategy that can, we can, which can be like using ranges of values, probability density function, ensemble, uh, forecasting that can actually treat both epistemic and aleatoric uncertainties. In general, we can say that we also need um, the implementation of systematic ground and space while monitoring for active volcanoes with different characteristics. And uh, of course, all these and also um, these webinars, I see it as an opportunity and need um, of multidisciplinary collaboration and study. So as also Antonio and Joe said in the first two webinars, of course, we need to take advantage of the advancement in geophysical observation and technology for a stronger coupling um, modeling observation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Costanza. Uh, sorry, we can't do uh, audio clapping. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, just as a reminder, the format of our webinar is such that before we go on uh, to Larry Mastin's talk, we, we have a few minutes uh, um, of questions. Uh, for you that, that you can ask uh, about uh, Costanza's talk to Costanza. And in order to ask those questions, on the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a Q&A uh, uh, icon. If you click that, you can enter your question. And uh, we will then go down the list of questions, and you will be unmuted uh, and, and can engage uh, with Costanza uh, uh, you know, asking follow-up and so forth. Um, after Larry's talk, we'll do the same, and then we will conclude this webinar with uh, a half an hour uh, uh, discussion um, uh, where the speakers form a panel and you, the audience, or the attendees, again, can engage through the question and answer to discuss uh, about the science uh, of volcanic plumes, but also with the focus on the questions of uh, how can a modeling collaboratory uh, um, enhance uh, uh, the study of volcanic processes, including volcanic plumes, and what should that entail. Um, <clears throat> so I see we have several questions. Um, uh, Gabe, can you uh, unmute Julian? Uh, Julian, uh, would you like to ask your question directly? You are unmuted. Okay, um, 
you, you do have to unmute yourself, but I'll, I'll read it. Thank you very much for your presentation. Any recommendations to determine the characteristics of volcanic plume in real time when the eruptive pulse is at night? Um, well, you mean, sorry, in real time? Um, well, of course, I mean, that's a lot more tricky because, I mean, you don't have the, the visual camera and, I mean, you cannot really use, um, you cannot really use many sensors. So, I mean, that's actually uh, a tricky, a tricky one. I don't know, Larry, if you want to add to that. Okay. Um, we'll go on. No, I would say if Laddie wanted to, to add oh. to, to that. Sorry. Well, I, I, think, I think a lot of the satellite images that are taken now to detect ash are infrared images, which can see. Yes, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. At night. Um, so there are ways of processing those that could give you a plume height. But, um, and of course, radar can operate it at night also. Uh, yeah, the radar also, the, the, the good thing on the radar is also that uh, it's not affected by the weather conditions either. So in a way, the radar is a little bit, has advantages with respect to the, to the satellite. But the problem with the radar, of course, is that you need to have the radar and, and, the, the, and you need to have it like close to the, to the volcano because the farther you have it, the more uncertainty you have on the estimation of the plume height. They say so. Well, actually, of course, with a satellite, um, you don't need an in situ installation of the of the instrument. Okay, um, Susanna. Yeah, hope you can hear me. So, my question concerns marine ash deposits. Um, the small eruptions you can really reconstruct from from land, but the big eruptions, maybe size six, seven, eight, now. And, and so they will go into the marine environment. So can you go out in trail cores and piston cores from the marine tephra layers and try to reconstruct the column high and the mass eruption rate in similar models? Are these models applicable or are there too many different parameters? Yeah, okay. So if I understand, uh, well, the question, like when you have a lot of the material which is dispersed at sea, and then you have the possibility of using marine cores or lake cores, for example, in that case, you can use those to be able to reconstruct the deposit thinning. And then you can use those basically to, to calculate the mass, um, let's say the mass using the normal power law, wave rule, or exponential um, strategy. The plume height, of course, is difficult, uh, but I mean, the thing is when you, the plume height, you only need uh, the proximal data really to use the Carrick Sparks or the Rosetal model. You don't need the data in the far distal. Uh, so, it, so it doesn't really matter, let's say, because you need uh, particles of like, uh, like 1.6, 0 0.8 uh, millimeters. So you don't need like a micron particles because otherwise you cannot apply these models. Then of course you can use the inversion uh, as I showed, will be an analytical model like Tefra 2, and then you can use, um, you don't need the, the, the distribution of the largest class, you just need the mass per, per unit area um, and grain size, but if you don't have grain size, you can, you can try with the mass per unit area and calculate the plume height and um, the routed mass uh, from, from the, by inverting. So basically like you can use this core uh, information to get information on the eruptive source parameters, basically, as it has been mm -hmm. done actually for for uh, for some cases, like a, a pina tubo, for example, for sure, people use um, some C cores to constrain exactly because the problem with using these integration uh, strategies, empirical strategies, is that you need to capture the uh, decay trend and. Um, there are some studies where they use the, the marine core to constrain exactly this trend and, 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 and provide a kind of range of possible values of volume. How many cores would you would be needing? 10, 20? No, well, in this case, they only use one, actually. 
um, oh. because you just need, uh, if you have like a very far distal, you know, you need a leave, you know, of course, the more, you, the, the more you have, the better, that's always the case. But even if you have just one, that is nice because you can really constrain the, you can see, for example, if you, if you use the power law or the exponential, the wave bool on the proximal data, then you can use the, the distal uh, marine core to check whether the, the thinning trend is well reproduced because basically it should also uh, fit with the distal marine core. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, it, it's, it's approximated because of course it would be nice to have an, an isopack line and of course having many data, but you know, this is real life, right? And that's not, doesn't work like that. So if you only have one point, it's not ideal, but it's still better than nothing for sure. Yeah, and does the grain size, is the grain size distribution affected by the settling in the, in the water? Can that still be used? Yes, yeah, there is a nice paper actually of um, Carrie Tal where they did experiments of sedimentation of tephra in, um, in the ocean. And they just basically kind of realized that when tephra sediments in the ocean, in the sea, what happens is that they actually sediment in fingers, which is similar to the fingers that are formed in the atmosphere. So that was actually experiments that were done in water to demonstrate that the grain side distribution at the bottom of the ocean is actually representative of the sedimentation and is not basically affected by the uh, ocean current because it's actually settling in these vertical fingers. Okay. So yes, it's basically, it is representative. There is this uh, nice paper of Carey it's a 97, 96, something like that. Yeah. Um, talks about these experiments. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, uh, Johan, uh, uh, if you would like to ask your questions. Yeah, hi, thanks for the great presentation. Um, so deriving mass eruption rate from plume height in real time, uh, it doesn't necessarily account for uh, the MER that's partitioned into PDCs. For example, if you have an eruption column that's partially collapsing. Uh, so for example, Pinatubo 991 or Nova Rupta 1912, if you only had observations, say satellite observations of plume height, would you be able to accurately derive MER? And now in modern times, are people developing techniques to detect the occurrence of PDCs in real time and perhaps get estimates on, their, on the mass flux that they carry? Well, Maybe Joe can also help with that, but my, um, my idea is that depends on the dynamics and when the, the pyroclastic uh, flow actually form. Because if you have a plume that goes, that goes up, okay, and, and then of course, I mean, the, all the material which contributes to that uh, plume, um, so the, that mass eruption rate contributes to the, to, to the height of the plume. Then, of course, if you have the, the formation of the, pyroclast the pyroclastic flow, straight away, like at the same time as the plume goes up, then I agree, then you cannot be able to capture it. But if you have the formation of the pyroclastic flows after, I don't know, half an hour or, or an hour or so on, at that point, I mean, the mass eruption rate uh, calculated from the plume height, that also accounts for that material because that material also uh, is what contributed to the height. But then of course, if you have like a, um, basically like formation of large pyroclastic flows at the very beginning, uh, or the eruption, that's a different story. That's a different story. I don't know like, if the other panelists want to add to that. Yeah, it's a difficult question, Yoshi. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, think Cassandra is spot on that, you know, the, obviously you're measuring the stuff that's going into the plume with the, the height. But um, yeah, I think there are a number of ways you might be able to get at this question, but in real time, it's very challenging. Um, if you maybe be able to get some seismic correlations, but that's not been done really yet, so. But yeah, then ultimately, and... like if you want to do it in real time, I mean, th the reason why you want to have the mass eruption rate in real time is mostly for uh, aviation. So basically for, for, for actually special forecasting. So mm -hmm. at that point, you don't care about the PDCs. I mean, you actually care about the, the, the mass which is injecting the, in the atmosphere that eventually forms an umbrella cloud and is dispersed. So you don't really care uh, that you have progressive flows at that point for aviation, I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, I, sorry, I just had a quick follow-up because there's also eruptions that like co columns as well. Um, and so 
is it straightforward then in the same way to derive the mass? I guess it would be the MER coming from the pyroclastic flow that's feeding yeah. that column from the height measurement you get from the Coignambrite cloud? No, actually, well, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, no, it's different because actually the Coignambrite uh, core PDC cloud, as you want to call it, um, is, is, can be treated as a thermal. It's not a sustained plume. Therefore, cannot you know the, the the it doesn't have a mass eruption rate. It's an instantaneous injection of mass into the atmosphere. So, like in fact, you, there's no uh, meaning in saying that there is a mass eruption rate associated with the CoPDC plume because it's a thermal. So you you have ways of calculating the mass associated with a, Co a CoPDC plume from the height. So there, basically, there are, there are some works like a Woods and Killer, for example, where you can, you, you can, you can do that. I mean, but, but it's the mass. It's not the mass eruption rate. So, of course, it's a completely different right. parameterization formulation. You don't use the same uh, equation that I use for sustained plume because yeah. all these equations that I use for the calculation of mass eruption rate from, from the plume height, the assumption is that it's a sustained plume. So if you have mm -hmm. a volcanic eruption, a CoPDC, all of that, you cannot use these equations. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, uh, I apologize, Carlos. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, it seems like you have a very uh, well-defined question, perhaps a uh, follow-up by email with Costanza, or, or maybe we can get to it uh, during the discussion session. Uh, and real briefly, uh, Kathy Cashman uh, had a follow-up comment uh, to Susanna's question. Um, she says, marine cores have been used effectively to assess uh, grain size distributions for both Pinatubo and uh, the Campanian. Okay, um, with that, I'll give it to Carl Anderson. All right, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Larry Maston. Uh, Larry is a volcano scientist at the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, Larry's worked extensively with both magma flow and plume models. Uh, so his work really covers volcanic processes from the reservoir all the way to ash deposition, and also from the research side of, side of things to uh, operational implementation. Uh, today, Larry will be presenting on operational aspects of ash dispersal modeling. Larry? Okay, thanks, Kyle. Um, can everybody hear me right now? Okay, good. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, I'll share the right one here. Um, OK. Can everybody see the screen right now? Looks like it's OK. So um, oops, let me go to the beginning. So um, I offered to give this talk on operational aspects of dispersal modeling. And the reason that I thought this was important is that we have basically a whole modeling community whose objective is to understand volcanic processes and to try to test our theories of how volcanoes work by modeling them and comparing them with observations. But there's another um, application of modeling which has to do with uh, modeling during eruptions and during periods of unrest to reduce risk and to uh, warn people of wh what areas might be affected by ash. And this, the modeling strategy and the requirements for the quality of data that come out of the models is rather different in that case, since you're really trying to provide information to decision makers and people who are trying to avoid ash. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk about that side and to also, hopefully bring up some issues that uh, that might be addressed by a modeling collaboratory uh, to contribute to the operational aspects of modeling. So what's my role? Um, I'm uh, a co-developer of one of the uh, TEFRA dispersal models, ASH3D. It's a model that was developed by three of us at the US Geological Survey. Um, and so I thought about volcanic processes and how to model them. But I'm also a, an observatory scientist. I work at the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory. I also have worked pretty closely with people at the Alaska Volcano Observatory who are um, monitoring Alaskan volcanoes. There's about 150 of them. There's more volcanoes in uh, 
in North America than um, in many other regions of the world. And so we are frequently in a case where one or, or more volcanoes in Alaska is in a state of unrest and we need to know where ash could go if it erupts. And then finally, um, for about 10 years until about a year ago, I was the co-chair of the Volcanic Ash Scientific Advisory Group, which is a group started by the World Meteorological Organization to advise volcanic ash advisory centers uh, on um, the state of the science of modeling and detecting and forecasting ash clouds. So that's sort of my link into the ash and aviation world. And, but really there are, there are many people who use models for operational purposes. Uh, obviously I can't report on how everyone uses these models, but I can report my own experience in the USGS and what I know about modeling ash and aviation from my role as the VOSAG co-chair. Um, so what do we mean by operational? And what I mean in this case is simply that the models are reply, applied to reduce risk either to aviation or to ground-based communities. Um, and there are several models that are being used operationally. Um, I've divided them into two sort of categories here. Uh, the first category are the models that use a three-dimensional di three time-varying wind field. So these are wind fields that are derived from numerical weather prediction models. Uh, in the US, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, produces models, several different models, um, and they post the model predictions uh, multiple times daily. Uh, in Europe, the, there's several European groups, the UK Met Office, the European Community for me Medium Range Weather Forecasting, Medio France, and so on, have their own meteorological weather prediction models that are used as the inputs to ash dispersal models. And those, those models, which I've listed here, um, there's probably others, uh, one advantage of these models is that they can use both to forecast where ash clouds go, like I'm showing in the upper right, this is an ash 3D simulation, or where tephra is deposited. Um, one disadvantage of these kinds of models is that you have to download uh, probably several gigabytes per day of net, uh, NWP data. So if you work at a remote volcano observatory, you may not be able to use a model like this unless you can log in remotely to another computer that's already downloading those data. Uh, another, the other category of models are those that use a one-dimensional wind sounding. So Ashfall and Tephra 2 are examples. Advantages of those are that they run in seconds rather than minutes or hours. So you can get, you can get results very quickly and that they require a minimum amount of data to use as inputs. But the disadvantage is that they can only be used for deposits. I should also mention that both of these categories of models don't consider the dynamics of the rising plume. They simply put ash in the atmosphere and then calculate how it settles and blows down wind uh, with time. So if there are various th things that have to do with plume dynamics, for example, the development of pyroclastic flows, um, those things are not included in these models. So who uses TEFRA dispersion models? Um, the most high profile users are uh, the volcanic ash advisory centers. So about 30 years ago, after a few high profile cases where jet airplanes flew into ash clouds, the international aviation community, primarily the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization, realized that there had to be um, centers around the world whose job was to detect and track and forecast ash clouds and communicate where those ash clouds were to the aviation community. So they divided the world into, into nine regions, which are shown here. Um, and within each region, they assigned a volcanic ash advisory center. So for the North Atlantic, London, the UK Met Office has uh, a volcanic ash advisory center. For this really large region that extends from Central Europe through Africa and the Western and Western Asia, um, the Toulouse FAC 
operated by Medio France is responsible in North America from the Canadian border down to Ecuador and from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge roughly as far west as the Marianas. NOAA's uh, Volcanic Ash Advisory is responsible. There's one in Anchorage that's responsible for the Pacific and so on. So these, uh, these are run by meteorological agencies, not by volcanologists. And, um, and they are, there are specific protocols they have to follow for how these warnings are issued. Now, when it comes to, to forecasting TEFR deposits, m much of that is done by volcano observatories. So volcano observatories are typically set up by uh, national agencies within each country. And what I've shown here are the, um, the volcano observatories that are using the ASH3D model. There's many others that use probably other models, but um, they, uh, they monitor the volcanoes and they will work with local authorities to issue forecasts for where ash will go. Um, so those are the, the, the main groups that, uh, that are of interest, I think, for operational modeling. So when are models used? And so I, there's basically th three times when models are used. One is between eruptions, we can run models probabilistically. So you set up a thousand model runs, for example, of an eruption of the size of the May 18th, 1980 uh, eruption in Washington. And for each simulation, you would randomly pick a wind field within the historical wind fields of the Pacific Northwest in the US. and and then you, you might pick a, a particular place. Uh, let's see, how do I get rid of this? Whoops. Um, like for example, the, uh, Sp the city of Spokane and say, well, what percentage of those model runs dropped over a 10th of a millimeter of ash in Spokane? You can do that for any number of, put a whole grid on the map and, and draw a contour draw contour lines showing the percentage of time when ash was deposited in those areas. And so we've, we've done this for most of the Cascade volcanoes. You can also, from those same simulations, you can estimate the amount of time it would take to get to these cities. And uh, we've presented those data to local authorities. This was a road trip we took um, to Eastern Washington last fall Carolyn Dreger and Jessica Ball and, I, and myself from the USGS visited with uh, people in these communities, this was in Spokane, to show them uh, what we knew about how often they would get ash and how much ash they might get and, and how long it would take um, to get ash. And what we found was that the level of interest and the need for probabilistic data varied significantly depending on who we were talking to. If you were talking to the first responders like, like the state patrol, they only needed to know, you tell them this is basically an event that happens about once per century, they'll say, okay, fine, uh, get back to me when you start to see unrest and then we'll start paying attention. But you might talk to, for example, the Department of Energy, which runs a nuclear waste reprocessing facility at Hanford, and they have a statutory requirement to consider any natural process that has an annual probability greater than one, about one in 10,000 and could significantly disrupt their operations. So they are, they are very interested in probabilities. There are other, other groups like um, people who are responsible for infrastructure in hospitals like HVAC systems who may not, who may want to know long before an eruption that their HVAC system could be disrupted by ash and want to plan for how to make sure that HVAC system is still operating in the event that they get ash. So that each of these groups has to make a decision based on probabilities, but the, the need of each group for specific probabilities varies a lot depending on the group you're talking to. So, but all of them said, okay, that's fine, but really what we want to know most is when unrest starts, what are you going to tell us about where ash could go? So um, this has really been something that the Alaska Volcano Observatory has had to deal with a lot. 
Uh, and if you go to the USGS Volcano Hazards webpage, which has just been re re recently revamped, it's usgs.gov natural ha slash natural hazard slash volcano hazards, you'll see a map of active volcanoes in the US and each of the green triangles on this map is a volcano that's being monitored and is currently uh, not at an, at an elevated state of unrest. The white ones are volcanoes that are not currently being monitored. The yellow ones, and under some circumstances, you may, may see orange or red ones on this map, are volcanoes that are being monitored and are showing some elevated activity, either increased earthquake activity, um, gas flux, or uh, geodetic uplift or something that suggests that they could potentially erupt within hours, days, or weeks. And for those volcanoes, uh, currently, this was a few days ago when I got this screenshot, there were two semi sapochnoi and Great Sitkin volcanoes that were at a state of an elevated state. And so if you um, go to this website and click on any, either one of these, for example, Great Sitkin, what you'll see is a status page that shows you, uh, for example, a series of daily updates. There are updates issued every day for those volcanoes that are in a state of unrest. Um, you'll also see a series of model simulations. These models are run twice a day and uh, one simulation forecasts where ash would go at, on that day if it erupted. There are a series of other simulations that show the height of the cloud, the cloud load, and um, and another that's simply a puff model simulation, and a fourth one, which you may or may not be able to see, which is a high split model trajectory. Um, these are run basically by assuming a certain eruption size, which we think might be characteristic for that, uh, for that volcano. And if you click on one of them, for example, ash cloud load, it'll, it'll show you a, um, a simulation. So these products are publicly available. They are used um, by mariners, for example. Uh, this area in, in the north of the Aleutians is used for fishing and for merchant marine operations. Uh, it's also uh, an air, there's a lot of air travel between North America and East Asia that goes over this area. So um, airlines, for example, Alaska Airlines, which flies in these routes frequently, um, may refer to these data uh, for flight planning operations. And of course, the National Weather Service that operates the Anchorage VAC uh, is, uses these data also. So those are, uh, those are simulations that we run every day in the event of an eruption. What do we actually do when an eruption occurs? And in the last few years, we've gotten sort of more institutionalized in how this is done. Um, it really was tested. The, the current operating procedure was, was implemented uh, a few years ago uh, when Bogoslav volcano started erupting. So in December of 2016, this volcano, which you can see up here in the, in the upper right, it's this tiny island that's less than a kilometer in diameter north of the main trend of the Aleutians. Uh, and it started erupting in December of 2016 and it produced more than 70 eruptions between December 2016 and about August of 2017. And so, a lot of these eruptions happened like on a Friday afternoon or on Christmas Eve or something. And, and about 10 years ago when we had had our previous, you know, major incident of unrest when Redoubt was threatening to erupt in 2009, we actually had somebody sitting 24 hours a day in the operations room at CVO or at, a at AVO. Um, and we've moved away from that in recent years so that people can do the monitoring and model running from home. Uh, so during this period, there was an assigned ASH3D duty scientist. So the people would trade off the job, but basically that was the person that you would call in case there was actually an eruption and they would start an ASH3D simulation and they, they would post that, the result and they would, um, they would contact uh, or uh, 
Christy Wallace probably would contact the Anchorage VAC and let them know what our simulations were telling them and compare them with, with the VAX simulations, which were using the PUFF model. Um, so this is one example from the May 17th, 2017 eruption, uh, which sent ash to the south. Um, Dutch Harbor is the largest settlement in the, in the Eastern Aleutians. That's the, the, it's the city that most of the fishing boats go to to resupply. So there's a, at least a few thousand people who live in that area and would be affected by ash if, if it were to fall. And of course, the, the aviation community is always affected if there's ash in the air. So uh, our, our webmaster was smart enough to set up the um, model interface so that it could be run on the web using a minimum number of input parameters. And it could also be run on a phone. So you could, there was one time when I was on a bike ride in the Columbia River Gorge and I got a call from Michelle Coombs saying, um, Bogoslav is erupting, can you start an ash 3 d simulation? So I was able to actually start it from the phone and um, we had a certain options so that you could, uh, you could set it up to automatically rerun every 12 hours. You could set it up so that the re results were public and you could share it with certain user groups, the internal AVU user group and the user group at the Anchorage VAC, for example, would directly see these data as soon as they were published. So these are things that have nothing to do with modeling processes, but they have everything to do with being able to communicate the results in a timely manner and getting, getting the model running as soon as possible after the eruption starts. So that's, that's the way that we at the USGS do our modeling of primarily TEFRA fall, but also um, ash clouds. But the USGS doesn't have the authority to issue warnings of ash clouds. That authority lies with these VACs. And, um, and the VACs that have been established were established by the International Civil Aviation Organization. Their authority is very formalized. ICAO is basically the United Nations Treaty Organization that writes the rules for air travel. So um, they wrote the rules for how uh, how um, forecasts of ash are, are being communicated. And this is a, a photograph I took in 2009 when I visited the Anchorage VAC at a time when readout was threatening to erupt. erupt. So the, the people who work at these VACs, like the lady who's sitting at the desk here, um, this is the, the VAC desk at the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit, which is uh, basically a weather service office that issues for typically weather forecasts, but they have one desk which is for volcanic ash and the person who mans that desk, they take three eight hour shifts, 24 hours a day, is a meteorologist. They're not a volcanologist, they're not a modeler, they know how to write weather forecasts and they can communicate with the um, Alaska Volcano Observatory. So you can see that she's looking at a seismogram, this is probably something that was shared by AVO with them, a webcam of readout, satellite images. And so they periodically scan satellite images. A lot of that is done automatically now, but there are still places where they do it manually. Um, and they look for evidence of ash clouds. And when ash clouds are detected or when they get some other communication that an eruption is ongoing, and that communication can be either a pilot report. It can be a phone call from AVO saying we've got increased seismic activity. Uh, it, can, it can be if the meteorologist themselves looks at a satellite image, as an image and sees what they think is an ash cloud um, or automatic notices which now come from, for example, the University of Wisconsin. They will um, typically start a model simulation. Traditionally, the way they've done it is they'll, they've done one model run using the best observations they have at the moment, which usually is some idea of the eruption start time and the plume height. Um, the other source parameters like total grain size distribution are things that a meteorologist will know nothing about and those will have to be set by somebody who's the model developer based on what we know are uh, typical grain size distributions for eruptions, for example. They're not gonna have the time to deal with those sorts of things. 
And in this case, this is an example from the March 23rd, 2009 eruption at Readout. Uh, here's a model simulation that shows that the ash cloud might look like sort of an inverted V. This is a satellite image from roughly the same time as that simulation showing sort of one arm, the warm colors are the, are the cold temperatures in this infrared image. And it basically shows one arm of that inverted V, but there's no left arm. And so a, a forecaster is gonna have to look at this and say, why is there a discrepancy? Is it because the left side is a lower cloud and it's simply not standing out in this IR image? Is it, be, is it perhaps covered by meteorological clouds? They'll have to make a, a human judgment decision on where to draw a polygon. So in the upper right-hand corner, what, you'll see, what you see are these polygons that are hand drawn by the forecaster showing where they think the ash cloud will be at this time. And so they'll, they'll have the current time and then uh, a time that's six, 12 and 18 hours in the future showing the location of this cloud. So this is the formal product that is issued by volcanic ash advisory centers um, to warn of, of cloud movement. It's not a, it's not a model output it's a human judgment decision that's based on both model results and observations. Um, and so uh, if we look at the different ways that models are run between forecasting deposits and ash clouds, uh, for forecasting deposits, those models are typically run by volcano observatories under local authority the main value of the output is really qualitative. Which way is the wind going to blow? Which areas are likely to get ash? And the re results are used informally. There's only a certain subset of groups that use these information that want hard numbers. Um, when modeling ash clouds, the, uh, there's a spe specific international protocol for who has the authority to issue these warnings and the communication products that come out of them. Um, one other important thing is the output lines that come out of these, for example, the edges of the polygon that's drawn may have regulatory weight. So in, in Europe in 2010 and in, in certain other places, the edges of that polygon were the edges of an official fl no fly zone. Um, and so there were enormous e economic implications from that. And in, in Europe, uh, following the 2010 eruption, which I'm about to talk about, these quantities, for example, ash concentration became critically important. Um, so we moved from the situation where quantities are not that important, for example, for deposits, to certain cases modeling ash clouds where they're critical. And the, uh, the situation that really developed that caused this change was the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010, which closed thir over 300 airports, over 10 million passengers were stranded and so on. And the polygons that you see in the, right, in the map on the right were the polygons issued by the UK Met Office um, for their, their estimated location of the ash cloud. This was on the 18th of April. Uh, and over much of this region, there was no visible cloud, and yet um, there was no flight allowed. Uh, and because of all of the disruption that was caused by this, the regulators in Europe went back to the UK Met Office and said, if there's no visible ash cloud, we think that it's probably so dis diffuse that we can't restrict flights in that area. And they had to come up with a solution basically over a weekend as to how to solve this problem. And the solution they came up with was requiring that the UK Met Office issue, instead of polygons on a map, that they issue direct model output that had contours of concentration. So these are um, contours. This is uh, for a later eruptive period in, in May um, from AIA. And the edges of, the, of this red area, for example, is bounded by the 0.2 millimeter 0.2 milligram per cubic meter uh, airborne ash concentration that was forecast by the model. And then by two milligra milligrams per cubic meter and four milligrams per cubic meter. Um, this change in the requirement was only applied in Europe. 
And over a two year period, there was a series of meetings in Montreal, uh, the International Volcanic Ash Task Force to decide among other things, uh, how we could improve our forecasting ability and whether to apply this new regulatory requirement globally. And after that two year period, it was decided that we, we would not make it global, but there has been discussion ever since then the World Meteorological Organization, for example, now has the goal of forecasting uh, quantitative concentrations starting probably within a few years from now. And so this is, this is very, really a, a major challenge for modeling. How do we make uh, models uh, accurate enough and how do we have enough confidence in our models that we can forecast airborne ash concentrations uh, it, and provide meaningful numbers. Um, and there's been a whole series of meetings really starting with the 2010 meeting that Costanza talked about as to how to improve ash forecast accuracy. Uh, one, of the, one of the methods um, which seems to be gaining traction is to use some, some way of combining forward modeling with observations. In the last 10 years, there's been a whole new constellation of satellites uh, that have been launched around the world that have multiple infrared channels that have much higher resolution than previous satellites and that have um, faster refresh rates so that you can get multiple uh, images that can be processed to give you, uh, for example, the mass load in a cloud. So this is, this is a, a simulation that Arno Folk from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center sent to me using the Fall 3D model, where they have on the right-hand side, they have processed satellite data that provides ash column load uh, from the Cordon Calle eruption. On the left side of the, of the image is a single forward model that's done using prior information on eruption source parameters. And, and the, uh, the one in the middle is a result that combines by automatically comparing the forward modeling result with the ash cloud concentrations that were observed in satellite, uh, a new model simulation with revised source parameters that optimizes the fit between the um, observed and the, uh, and the model results. And I'm, as far as I know, um, although there are several groups that are doing this, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, the UK Met Office, the Barcelona Su Supercomputing Center, even Roger Denlinger at CVO has been uh, experimenting with, with this kind of approach. Um, most area, place, parts of the world that, that still issue volcanic ash advisories are using the traditional method of doing a sin, sin, single forward simulation using the best observations available and, um, and coming out with, with a result. Um, but that's one of the, I think that's the direction that things are going to in the future. Another thing that, uh, that the Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers have been doing has been com uh, comparing their modeling methods and identifying the areas that ne really need work. This started in 2012 with a meeting in um, College Park, uh, Maryland, where they made a list of the, the most important source parameters and sort of ranked what we knew about constraints in the, those source parameters on a scale of one to five, for example. Um, the, what we know about eruptive plume height, well, that's something that you can observe during an eruption. So we have a pretty good constraint on that. Um, what do we know about the vertical and horizontal distribution of mass in the initial plume? Not a whole lot because these models don't, mo they don't simulate plume dynamics. So things like column collapse or even partial column collapse that could, that could, could result in elutriation of ash at, at up to heights that are quite different from the umbrella cloud height. Uh, we don't, in many cases, we don't have observations that constrain those factors during an eruption and there's no way to include them in models. Um, so uh, another, th another advance that is taking place is there are a whole series of new technologies that have developed in the last 10 years that can automatically detect ash clouds. Uh, for example, this is a, an algorithm that was developed by Mike Pavilonis in Wisconsin 
that will use the spectral characteristics of ash clouds to try to identify them automatically in satellite images. When it finds one, it will issue uh, notifications to anybody on a subscription list. Volcano observatories or VACs can get these and it'll alert them to the possibility that an ash cloud exists. Um, worldwide lightning location networks, which will identify clusters of lightning around volcanoes like Bogoslav uh, and send notifications, say, which alerts people to the possibility of eruption. And then infrasound, which has become much more widely used in the last 10 years or so. Um, so how does operational modeling differ from research? Uh, well, one, speed is really a key. We want models that run in minutes, not hours or days. Uh, ease of use, because many of the people who are running these models are not modelers, they're um, forecasters. We, we want things like graphical user interfaces. We want uh, the option that they be able to set a minimum number of source parameters like plume height and eruption start time. Um, other, other source parameters we're going to have to assume and then finally, complex processes like aggregation or the dynamics of the plume are pretty much ignored in these models, but some of them can have first order effects. Uh, and I think uh, being able to identify what those effects are and how they, how they can change a model result um, and incorporating sort of a simplified version of what we understand into these models could per perhaps improve their accuracy. This is, I added possible MCS work to this because I, I think it's, it may be, this is one place where the modeling collaboratory could have some impact. Um, and then finally, what are the future directions? Uh, better observations, integration with observations, um, automation to detect eruptions and compare them with observations, understanding complex processes like plume dynamics and so on, and defining best modeling practices. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I guess I went on over a bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, so we'll not do a five to 10 minute Q&A with Larry before we go ahead and open up the discussion for all the panel members. Um, as a reminder, please type your questions or comments into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll try to unmute you so you can ask your question yourself or if necessary, we can go ahead and ask it for you. So questions and comments for Larry. Okay, we have a question from Julian. Can you go ahead and ask your question? Um, okay, I'll go ahead and ask for you. Uh, thank you much for your presentation. Is it possible in the ASH 3D model input parameters that you can adjust column height variables for values of less than five kilometers and for volumes of eruption of less than, looks like 100,000 cubic meters? So uh, it, it depends on whether you're running the model at the command line or at the graphical user interface. The, for, the, for, the, for the graphical user interface, which a lot of people use at volcano observatories around the world, um, we've set these error traps uh, to, it. for example, it calculates eruptive volume based on your stated plume height and duration. And if you enter a plume height that is too low um, so that the volume is, negligible, it will not run. But um, at the command line, you can do pretty much whatever you want. <laughs> uh, so maybe we could talk offline if you have some specific questions about how to um, do the modeling you're interested in, we could maybe uh, just send me an email, lgmaston at usgs.gov and we could talk about that. Great, next question is from Inat Lev. Uh, she says, who has the mandate to develop these operational models? Uh, make them user-friendly, benchmarked, accessible, et cetera. Are this the, the AACs or the USGS, NOAA, uh, NSF? Every time somebody asks a question, it jumps on my screen. Um, <laughs> so, so who has the mandate to develop the operational models? Um, Many of the operational models are, were written by, for example, the, the name model was written by the UK Met Office and they use that operationally. The high split model was written by NOAA, but 
Buenos Aires, the VAC at Buenos Aires uses the fall 3D model, which was written by the Bar Barcelona Super Supercomputing Center. Um, and so they, they developed a working relationship with the BSC, the Buenos Aires VAC, and found that the model pretty much did what they wanted to. So they, um, they've had a, 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 you know, a lot of collaboration. TEFRA 2, I know, is used by quite a few volcano observatories to do uh, deposit modeling. I think these institutions that, that have the responsibility of forecasting will use whatever is available. Um, and so if somebody develops a product that, that they find useful, they will probably use it. And um, it's not really, even though many of the models are written by agencies that have the authority to issue these forecasts, they're not exclusively that way. Okay, next is a comment from Dave Hyman. Dave? Uh, hey, Larry. Uh, really, really great talk and fascinating material. Um, I just wanted to note that the uh, uh, ICAO and IAVW standards are indeed changing, uh, and they're going to include uh, quantitative uh, volcanic ash advisories uh, with uncertainty, so probabilities and that sort of thing. Um, and that's going to go into effect as early as 2023. They have this roadmap where 2023, I think, is like a best effort basis, and then it goes through 2026, 2029, where it's going to become, uh, I think, required. Um, and so the issues you're raising about, especially data insertion and these sort of uh, ensemble common filter models are definitely going to become a main focus in the coming years. Um, and so we're, we're currently working on uh, various kind of probabilistic observations as well that we think will fit, fit in there. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Dave. I kind of glossed over that um, partly, I think, because I've, I know a little bit about it, but not a lot. But that's, that, it sounds like that's going to be a pretty big jump in the way that people are doing things at VAX, that the way that forecasts are going to be issued. Okay, Carlos has a question. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, thank you and hi to, hello Larry and everyone. This is a, a great uh, webinar. Thank you to you. Uh, I guess this is a great opportunity to say thank you to Larry Mastin and USGS because we, we in the Colombian Geological Survey, we are users of ASH 3D software. It's very useful for us uh, in order to, to, to try to, to, to make a quick forecast uh, when we have a, a ASH emissions, for instance, for, for, for Nevado del Ruiz. I, I have a general question for, for Larry and, and to you according with you, your experience. In, in our group, in our monitoring group, uh, there are some opinions about the convenience to put in, the, in, in, in our web, website all the days, the, the, the forecast, the, the, the simulations from NASH 3D in, in this case, because so, some people in our group say, okay, maybe, maybe the people, the population, the authorities, maybe can confuse because maybe think that all the days we have uh, ash emissions. And you know, <laughs> not all the days we have ash emissions. So some people say, be careful because maybe the people can think, okay, there are everyday ash, ash emissions. So according with our experience in our countries, what could be what could do better in in this time our position is okay when we have a confirmed ash emission we we put in our website in in, in our social networks the, the information from ash 3d ash 3d simulation what, what is your experience about this within your countries thank you very much again thank you carlos for the for the pitch um i think that this is probably, a, a, I don't know if Christy Wallace is on the line, but um, we, in, so I know that when, uh, when AVO developed the page for volcanoes that are in unrest that shows those simulations, 
there was a lot of thought put into the words that were used on that page. They emphasized that the simulations that are shown are uh, basically scenario runs that use inputs that are assumed values for, um, you know, if an eruption were to occur at Great Sitkin, uh, you know, they would assume a, a certain plume height and duration. And um, I, you're right that people assume either that the, an eruption has occurred if they click on those simulations or they assume that if the cloud is going north, that that's the direction that's definitely going to go. Whereas uh, if there's a lot of wind shear in the atmosphere and the plume height is wrong, the cloud could go east or west rather than north. And so um, I think maybe uh, you and I and Christy should talk offline about what, what AVO does with people who, um, perhaps have the misimpression that that those emissions are are uh, more frequent than they are but um that it's not it's not something that i've heard them talk about much but i can imagine that it could be an issue okay thank you so much mm -hmm. great okay. uh, thank you. sorry uh kyle and i cross fires here um uh, uh thank you very much Larry and Costanza uh, for your talks and um, we'll move on to the panel discussion section of, of the webinar now. Um, if you would like to participate, if you have a comment or a question, just go into the Q&A and, and let us know. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a question, I would like to say something and then we'll uh, uh, unmute you and, and you can, can uh, react directly with the panel. The panel again is uh, going to be uh, today's and Tuesday's speakers, Larry, Antonio, Joe and Costanza. Um, <clears throat> now, just to, um, to, you know, what is this panel discussion supposed to be about? Uh, You've probably all seen this uh, document that we've made available. It summarizes uh, some of the issues that the speakers uh, thought were, were of importance and, and interest uh, overall in terms of the modeling collaboratory. Um, now, in, in terms of the overall scope of the subduction zone 4D effort and, and hence the modeling collaboratory, Much of it is focused more on the subsurface, of course, going all the way down to the subducting slab. Um, and so um, we kicked off sort of starting uh, with volcanic blooms and hopefully going forward with future webinars and, and or workshop, we'll uh, start focusing uh, more deeply. Um, what we'd like to discuss for the panel discussion is you know, overall volcanic system science, how uh, would volcanic system science, including plumes, benefit from a collaboratory? What should the collaboratory look like? Um, how can we integrate it all? And again, um, if you would like to participate, have comments or questions, just let us know through the Q&A uh, uh, functionality and we'll unmute you. And uh, the first person who has a question or comment is actually Chuck uh, Connor. And so I'll give it to Chuck. Hey, thanks, Olga. And uh, hey, great, awesome talks, everybody, all four of you. I really appreciate it. Um, learned a lot in these last two days. Um, in terms of a modeling collaboratory, um, one of the things I felt when I was listening to all your talks is uh, volcanologists are like other scientists, we want to create a lot of models. <laughs> we want to create our own models and, and um, you know then we often get around to comparing the results through benchmarking or whatever you want to call it into a model comparison. But what I you know I've developed models and I really have no idea if um, you know the, the actual functions in my models are the same or different than the functions in other people's models. So for example Costanza described um, 
you know, grain size distribution because that's a fundamental control on part of the fall time and part of the residence time in the atmosphere. Uh, does TEFRA too use the same uh, function to, to estimate particle settling velocity as ash 3D or fall uh, 3D or whatever? I mean, we're, where, and where are the models on a functional level fundamentally different? So, so is there a strategy for better understanding what's actually the same and what's actually different in these, all these models? What's your opinion? Yeah, there was also a question before um, that I just kind of quickly addressed about what is the um, courses brain size that can be treated by models. And I think it's was part of this because it depends on the model. So I guess, you know, models should be really um, like understood better to be able to use, because the total grain size distribution, of course, is important if the whole spectrum is used in the model. But if it's only, if the model only considers the finance, then you don't need the information on the course material. So that's something that depends really on the model that people are using. Sorry, Antonio. No, uh, I want just to comment uh, uh, on this point uh, I, I was raised uh, uh, by Chuck. Yes, uh, uh, for example, when we did the intercomparison uh, model uh, study, we were aware of this uh, difference. In fact, first things we did is uh, to try to set all, uh, all this kind of function the same. Uh, I mean, say, arranging, for example, the kind of uh, total grain size distribution had to be uh, the same for all the model that he used, because as Constance said, there were some model who needed the uh, total grain size distribution model that they didn't need. So do we try to set up uh, in, in case uh, if, if mo then some model use just one particle, some model use distribution. So we had the first things we had to do was uh, this. This took a uh, lot of time to set up uh, the condition for this study. Yeah, I guess, you know, it would take a lot of work, but one, one other thought, and this could be an effort from the MCS is, uh, is really to think a bit more about modular programming, whether or not pieces of one model could be plugged into another, and that would take probably dedicated computational staff to help help that out. But that'd be one way to have it all out, out front and uh, and to try to integrate that. And some communities have made progress toward that sort of uh, system. Yeah, I, um, since there are no questions, I'll, I'll, I'll insert myself as well in, into the discussion. Um, something that, that you know, prompted this thought actually on Tuesday, but, uh, uh, you know, Chuck's question, uh, comment, uh, you know, focused it more. Um, to me, there's sort of a, sort of this balance between, you obviously don't want to have the master model, right? You, you do want different models, people pursuing things from different angles, uh, uh, different, uh, emphasis on, on, on different aspects. That's how you, you advance science, I think, right? You, you don't, you can't have sort of this programmatic master plan. You say, okay, the next five years, you know, this is the model, right? Uh, uh, or this is the whatever observation integration in, into models. So I think one thing that in my mind, in terms of a modeling collaboratory, which is of course more uh, research focused than operational, is sort of striking a good balance between integration, moving the whole field forward, but at the same time not stifling, uh, um, you know, uh, innovative, creative, uh, PI-driven science. And and um, uh, the example that Larry said in terms of the various models used by different uh, agencies is a good one, right? Uh, one hand, you'd say, well, shouldn't this be standardized? On the other hand, well, maybe it shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I think that the advantage of having multiple models out there is that you have multiple developers who are each thinking about a different aspect of the problem and finding ways of advancing. Uh, and as long as you have, you know, people working on the problem from different angles, um, 
you know, there are there are aspects of the problem that some of us thought were completely unimportant, and then somebody wrote a paper showing how uh, how important it was, for example, to couple uh, real time calculations of numerical weather prediction models into an ash dispersion model um, because you could get uh, you know rapid changes in the weather, for example, which may only be caught. Um, not not so easily in a dispersion model if it's just reading uh, weather data every six hours. If uh, if the weather is being recalculated every minute or two, uh, you could pick up those changes in wind speed and direction uh, much more rapidly. And and uh, so things like that that uh, you know that we hadn't thought about. If you have multiple models out there and multiple modelers, you find more more rapid advances. Yes, I can, I can add some things. Uh, this, this is uh, agree with Larry in some part. He, he, Tuesday, I never mentioned the model. I, I, talk, the, uh, I was talking about uh, categories, type of models, you know. And uh, basically, in the study, we were able, for example, the blue models, we were able to identify that uh, if the conditions are set the same for the models, uh, the three different categories could give uh, a similar uh, answer. But this, uh, the fact that we have uh, so many models means uh, that probably we, there is some things uh, about the description of the process that we, we are not currently as community satisfied. In fact, uh, if we, we look at the experience of the community, like climate uh, weather model, they have much more community efforts. It's some things that uh, in, in volcanology means completely. You know? For example, WRF is a model that is uh, developed by a large number of, uh, of contributors. Each one develops one module, one specific aspect. And, but, the, uh, at least the community finds some things uh, in common to work. I don't think uh, as uh, science, uh, as in volcanology, we are still in this, uh, this stage, but hopefully in a decade or two, we should move, uh, and we should prepare things to move in that direction. But we can move in that direction only when we are, when we have identified the crucial needs in terms of modeling, crucial needs in terms of uh, a, a variable that needed to be assimilated and so on, like climatology and uh, atmos atmospheric science did in the last uh, 30, 40 years. So it, it seems to me that in terms of the plume uh, ash dispersal modeling, right, uh, the community may sort of be at the cusp of, of of some something like that, but then looking at all at a lot of the other type of modeling uh, related to volcanic systems, uh, uh, especially as you move further down towards magma chambers and so forth, uh, right? Uh, that part of our community is, of course, at, I think at a very different stage, and so the challenges for some, you know, an entity like a modeling collaborator is going to be to really uh, serve, you know, the broad community overall and, and uh, um, yeah, I don't have the answer. That's obviously why we're here. But uh, with that being said, um, uh, any of the participants, anybody in the audience, if you would like to participate, please just let us know through the Q&A um, uh, function at the bottom of your Zoom window and, and we'll unmute you. Uh, however, if you're an anonymous attendee, uh, we can do that. And so there is one question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I don't know who this is, of course. The question is, what potential is there to integrate plume slash column models with these dispersal models? Well, I, I know there are a few initiatives going, and, and uh, actually, uh, it, so Larry, um, Helga, myself, and a group at Michigan Tech and Goddard are working on one of these initiatives currently. Um, a lot of choices have to be made, lots of different time scales and, and spatial scales, but 
there is a potential to do this. You sort of have to be able to sample in space and time up to the model and then use that as a source condition for dispersal model. And uh, there's still a lot of choices that need to be made and it, say it's very much an active source of research. I guess yeah. my feeling is that uh, in understanding plume dynamics and how they feed, one of, one of the critical source parameters that I think people tend to neglect is the vertical distribution of mass in the plume. Uh, and I've always kind of had this prejudice that you have, a, you imagine a weak plume, a, a, a weak bent plume that um, probably has less of a concentration of mass near the top of the plume than say a strong plume or an umbrella cloud. But is that really the case? You can see examples of weak plumes that sort of rise like a smokestack and then and then blow down wind at some well-defined range of elevations. And then you can see other cases of Eyjafjallajökull, for example, pumping out ash and you can see this curtain of ash going basically from ground level all the way to the top of the plume. And those are two cases where you'd ex you would think that you should have a completely different mass distribution as a source parameter. But we don't really understand the, what causes that. Is it simply pulsing behavior that causes that, that wide range? Um, so ha having a better idea of the plume dynamics and what determines that vertical distribution of mass I think is important. And it could be either done by modeling or maybe better observations. Um, I think observations are critical. That's one thing that has really limited the rate of progress in this field is having eruptions where you have many good observations to constrain your models. Yeah, I, to I totally agree um, that that specific uh, source parameters requires for sure like a modeling effort more than the actual observation because the observation is a little bit tricky because of what we were saying before that each sensor uh, can only see part of the size spectrum so the, so say if you use the radar um, for example then then you see the distribution of certain particle sizes let's say but not the whole spectrum so somehow um, certainly for that specific and then from field forget it you know the can have information from the deposit. So um, I think, you know, the, the, this is a very important parameter um, where actually the, the models really do need to help because I mean, from the from direct observation is a little bit more tricky, I think. And then satellite, of course, is difficult because it integrates everything, right? Because you kind of look from the top. So, um, so yeah, so until we really, able to combine different sensors to give a mass, to, to provide a mass associated with certain sizes, it's very difficult, I think, to, to describe the vertical distribution of, of size and mass, which I agree, it's a crucial parameter for modeling. Yes, I agree, but uh, it's important to stress that um, it, even if it's uh, a modeling efforts that is needed, it's in any case uh, is uh, integrated with uh, the observations in, 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 the, in, in the sense. Nowadays, uh, we have a very powerful data simulation technique that um, currently use, uh, for example, the available data on the, on the part of the spectrum that uh, is uh, available, the data that are available. But, and this give much, if when it's used in combination with uh, models, can give much more information even uh, in the range uh, of the spectrum where we have, an, we have no information. And the only way to go beyond this is to use uh, a multiple observation that give information, complementary information. But th th this is only ideally because not all uh, not of all volcanoes, these are available. For example, satellites is uh, global and uh, it uh, can be used everywhere, for almost everywhere, if the conditions are low. It is. But radar, not only volcano, but radar, a two radar is very important to give uh, very crucial information on the range that uh, Constanza was mentioning. Yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd add to that too. There's a need for experiments that can link 
what you can measure from say radar and satellite and, and physical processes. So there's still a lot to go from observations even to what the models are actually calculating. I think there's still a role for a lot of large scale experiments and small scale experiments. Okay. For sure, we need to also implement or say the um, physical monitoring and more volcanoes that have like different eruptive styles and so on. So then we can actually break it. So otherwise we always, we always have the information from the same volcanoes, which are the most monitored <laughs> volcano. But then it's difficult to extrapolate, you know, and say, well, this is exact, this, this is how it works everywhere. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, as Antonio said, I mean, unfortunately there are still too few volcanoes that are well monitored. Um, so we really need to, to, to expand that and strongly couple geophysical observations with the modeling. But we need more uh, geophysical observations, let's say, uh, instruments. Okay, um, so we'll try to wrap it up in, in a few minutes. There are uh, a few questions, so that, that uh, uh, we, we, sh we would like to uh, still address. So the first one is uh, by Carlos. Uh, hi again. A, a little question. According to your experience uh, using different models, uh, in your opinion, what have, has been the success or unsuccess involving in the modeling topographic data in order to characterize the ash sedimentation and ash transport in the lowest atmospheric layers closer, closer to the terrain? There are some document examples of good correlation between simulation and field data or observations. Thank you. I guess maybe I should respond to that. Um, I think that, so Carlos, you have a real challenge in Colombia because you have volcanoes at high elevation with mountainous terrain. And um, for smaller, especially small eruptions that put a plume up to low elevation and that, and then the ash goes over mountainous terrain, I think in order to, um, you know, get a real realistic model simulation, you need both uh, good information on the plume dynamics and also a very high resolution uh, numerical weather prediction model that considers the topography in that area. Um, if you have um, wind fields that are localized in valleys, um, that's, that's something that you really can't get. Um, like, for example, ASH3D in forecast mode just uses the global forecast system weather prediction model, which has a half degree latitude and longitude before between nodal points. So it's not going to be good enough to consider the topography, you'd probably need a, a wharf model or um, some other high resolution model to get that. And uh, that's where, you know, you need, you need the help of model developers. The average person who works in a volcano observatory isn't gonna have that expertise or those kinds of facilities. Okay. Um, the uh, next question is by Joel Vicker. Um, and uh, I apologize, I guess. Uh, oh, there she is. Um, please go ahead and uh, ask your question, Joel. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and, and, and read it. Um, are you aware of anyone attempting eruption column collapse in pyroclastic flow models? Uh, yeah, there's several folks uh, sort of thing where you have an integrated uh, eruption and head column collapse. Um, folks at INGV have done this for many years, uh, and many other groups were doing some things. Um, but yeah, there are a number. And if you want to email me or one of the other panelists, I'm sure we can provide a bunch of uh, references too. Okay, uh, thank you, Joel. And uh, the last question uh, we can field uh, given given time constraints is by Chuan Gilchrist. Uh, Chuan, please go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, not necessarily a question, but I just 
just want to elaborate on Larry's point about the vertical distribution of mass in these eruption columns. I think I've seen a lot of examples of lower cloud layers spreading at the same time as the higher main umbrella cloud. And I think the Calbuco 2015 uh, videos that are in high definition are a prime example of this, where you have PDCs, uh, multiple lower clouds, and the umbrella cloud all spreading at the same time, albeit perhaps intermittently. Um, and I have a hypothesis that the jet plume transition height in these eruption columns is a key place where mass partitioning between buoyant rise and dense collapse, for example, could occur in these eruption columns. Um, and I think that 3D simulations, like what Matteo Cerminara has done and, and what we hope to do with Joe at, at UO, as well as analog experiments can help constrain specific source parameters where these kinds of complex dynamics in the column can occur. For example, the source conditions where partial collapse can occur. And we might be able to use that once we have that pretty well constrained with the experiments and the simulations, we might be able to use that to help parameterize these dynamics into uh, simple, more simple plume rise models that feed into volcanic ash transport um, and dispersal models. So just a comment there. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, and you can think of other examples. Mount, Mount St. Helens in 1980 was also very complicated. There was a rising plume at the same time that there are pyroclastic flows forming and, and ash elutriating off the pyroclastic flows to a different elevation. Um, it's hard to imagine if you're a, an operational model or at a vac, uh, you would probably have no idea that those complexities are even occurring. Um, you would have to have both the observations and some modeling skill in order to try to model those things in real time. But maybe, you know, maybe there's some ways of incorporating those, those possibilities in a general way. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, okay. If, uh, you, we we are the time to like, dropping up. I wanted just to make a comment. Uh, let me know. Uh, go ahead, make, make the comment, please. Yeah, I know. I just um, uh, I want to to comment about the change, the improvement, the progress we had in the last uh, ten years after a Yafiala Yokutra eruption. Everything changed dramatically, and uh, science improved uh, as well. This uh, mainly basically because uh, we moved uh, in Europe, we moved uh, from um, a Boolean criterion if there is a probability to have ash in the atmosphere or not to a quantitative one. This choice made pushed all the science to become more and more quantitative. quantitative. And this um, helped, uh, helped both uh, the community, not only the modeling uh, one, but also the observationalist, in, in intensified the relationship between the volcanologist and climatologist, between, uh, for example, people who use LIDAR, uh, use radar, and uh, people who are uh, just interested in volcanology issues, and uh, improve that uh, give a, a, a strong uh, effort to, to try to understand which is the intrinsic uncertainty related in the modeling, uh, uh, in the mo with the models. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm quite uh, confident that uh, if uh, the efforts follow this, uh, this trend in 10 years, uh, we will be in, um, in a condition similar to what uh, the sample I did before, the meteorology atmospheric community are uh, these days. But obviously to get, to achieve this, uh, this we need to, to keep continuing uh, uh, developing in co collaborative framework for our science. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Antonio. That was actually a, a good way to uh, wrap up this uh, panel discussion. Um, so um, I would like to once again thank uh, 
Costanza, Larry, Antonio, and Joe uh, for uh, participating, uh, giving uh, very interesting uh, uh, talks. And thank you again to all but, participants. But yes. Elke, I think uh, Chuck wanted to add something. He wrote in the, in the chat. Oh, well, it, I can add it quickly. I just wanted to um, uh, have, since, since there's still a group of people here, a large group of people, I mean, it'd be really interesting to also get any, get any feedback on um, the role of something like MCS in broadening participation and modeling among the community. I mean, from my perspective, there's a big challenge. Um, Larry mentioned operationally, people who aren't experts in modeling use the models. Um, and so it's worth broadening participation, but also um, uh, young scientists or scientists just trying to change direction, um, you know, want access to models. And so the question is, well, how can, how can MCS help with that and sort of democratize uh, our science with respect to modeling um, and uh, make these things more accessible? So, so to me, I mean, I, I, I really wonder if the panel can quickly discuss challenges and opportunities for this sort of thing, you know, just in general. You know, years ago, I would have suggested some sort of summer school, you know, for, for students. Um, that's more challenging now, but maybe that's an opportunity. Maybe we need to go to more of a web-based summer school that can reach more folks. So we have more of a comprehensive curriculum and we, I mean, this is more for a sort of dedicated folks that want to learn a lot of the, the programming, but I think we could do something like that. That might be something that would be great for MCS because a lot of the, the spin ups going to be the same for people looking at magma chambers to erupted plumes. Yeah, that, th thank you, Joel. Um, well, thanks, Chuck, for, for asking the question, and, 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 and thank you, Joel, for that answer. So I. Um, I would say that in previous uh, uh, MCS workshops, the idea of a summer school, uh, I think had a lot of traction and, and this definitely something uh, that, that you know, is uh, uh, on the radar in terms of MCS and, and um, uh, so yeah, thanks for suggesting that. I don't know if any of the panelists have something, anything to add. Well, I think, uh, for, I think, for example, um, the meetings that we had in Geneva in 2010-2013 for um, volcanic ash despair, well, real-time forecasting in civil aviation was a good opportunity. It was like a picture of the state of the art at that point in 2010-2013 that we put together these documents on a description of the existing models at that time and um, geophysical sensors that were used that they were they were used at that time to detect ash and gas uh, to a certain extent. I think you know, but then of course, as Antonio said, things are accelerating. You know, after you have to put all of course, there's been a, you know like a really rapid evolution. So, I mean, even from 2013, there have been uh, big changes. So, like another possibility would be to, to organize something similar to that to have another kind of like, because those kind of meetings are good to really understand where we are at and what we, what we should do to move forward, you know. But you need like two or three days together with breakout sessions like discussing and really go deep into modeling, uh, do physical techniques and so on. And of course now at COVID times, it's a little bit tricky. Could be done, I mean, remotely, I don't know. We can have breakout session in Zoom also. But it's really, I think, you know, meetings like that, which are really kind of um, technical meetings where you have modelers, uh, two physicists, field work analogies, you know, coming together and discussing like really kind of various issues and putting together documents which represent the picture of the state of the art at that point. I think it's, it's very good. I think it's uh, it really helped. And so this is more to try and, and track uh, the evolution of modeling and to physical mon monitoring and data simulation and so on. But then of course the summer school is, you know, can be a result of that. Once we know where we are at, then we know also what to, you know, what to, let's say, transfer to the younger generations, I would say. But like in me, I think it, it could be nice to have a meeting now or whenever we are free again to, 
to see and touch each other <laughs> again. <laughs> whenever that happens, whenever the day happens, you know, it would be nice to actually have another one of those because we had one in 2010, one in 2013. Now we are just kind of, uh, you know, it's be kind of good time to have another one on, the, on that line. Uh, yeah, very good comment. And um, I apologize. Uh, we are starting to... Uh, engage uh, a number of people, but we are also uh, unfortunately running out of time. Um, um, so, could I, could I just say one thing in 20 seconds, Helga? If we're talking about what to do with a collaboratory, there's two things that come to mind for me. One is a repository of building blocks for code snippets that will do things like settling velocities or advection subroutines, things that people can can go to to build their own models that start with you know some sort of building blocks. The other thing that we could re really use is a repository of good observations that people can use to to compare their models and validate them. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Larry. Uh, um, okay, there were um, yeah, a couple more. Um, I screwed up. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't know if I answered on the chat the uh, uh, the Q and A that the question would go away. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, but uh, but I can I can do you still see them, Helga? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Inat Lev uh, made a comment: a well-maintained repository of well-documented codes, including tutorials and videos, would be a good place for people to go and at least get started. And and uh, yeah, uh, I would like to add to that, right, that um, uh, absolutely, and, and I think um, uh, it's not just a matter of creating such a repository, but also enabling scientists who write codes uh, uh, to have the resources and the funding to, to create, you know, useful tutorials and so forth. Um, um, and I think that's uh, probably uh, another very important aspect, you know, so, and of course, having tutorials and then uh, written tutorials, but then actually tutorials through summer schools or, or meetings such as, as, as Joe and Costanza uh, uh, suggested uh, uh, is going to be very helpful as well. Um, a second comment by Colin Roswell is I would like to just point out uh, those last notes that access, uh, public domain models like Larry's Plumeria are incredibly helpful to be able to quickly pick up and start playing with to start learning through models. Open source access is huge for getting community expansion and uh, uh, Chuck replied yes with three exclamation marks and and again, my previous comment, I think, uh, uh, applies to this as well. It takes time, effort, uh, manpower uh, to make things that easily accessible and, and well documented. Uh, I think, in, you know, when you are working sort of as a PhD student trying to wrap up, uh, which, you know, it's often how science and academia ends up getting done, right? So. Um, I don't know if uh, any of the panelists just last comments uh, would like to address either Inat's or Colin's uh, comments. Okay, so again, uh, thank, thank you everybody very much uh, for participating. Um, a couple of, of, of uh, points. First of all, these webinars have been recorded. They are available on the Modeling Collaboratory's website. Uh, you can, uh, if you want to view any uh, of the presentations again or uh, some of the ensuing discussions. Please look for future uh, webinars. Um, we obviously would like to keep this going and have more discussions. Um, um, and more time for discussions. Ideally, we will have a proper uh, 
uh, workshop uh, where we can discuss over coffee and uh, food and, and beverages. Uh, we'll have to see. Um, if not, we'll do our best uh, otherwise. Anybody who is interested in engaging in the modeling collaboratory, uh, please reach out through, to us through the website. Um, last but not least, uh, we are going to make available a, a, um, uh, a survey, sorry, I couldn't think of the word, um, that you can fill out. Anybody who has participated uh, in these two webinars uh, will get an email. And if you have anything you would like to add, comments, uh, feedback, questions, please do so. And in particular, if, if you have any suggestions about the format uh, as we go forward uh, planning and, and implementing future webinars. So thank you again. And uh, if the